This episode of the Brilliance Plus Passion Podcast is brought to you by the Podcast Reach System. Are you ready to exponentially reach more profitable customers? Launching and hosting your own show is your proven best solution for networking, client attraction, and establishing your celebrity expert brand. Visit www.podcastreachsystem.com and claim your rightful place as the leading star of your industry so you make a difference for your community, market, and audience. Welcome to the Brilliance Plus Passion Podcast. Join us as we celebrate entrepreneurs, business creators, and brilliant minds who reveal what they are doing to make the world a better place by being part of it. Be sure to visit our website at www.brilliancepluspassion.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now sit back, lean in, tune in, get your notepad and two pens ready, and let's get started. My name is Adam Homey. I am your host, and I am honored by your wise decision to tune in and invest in yourself today. As you can see on the screen, if you're watching the video version or you're on our companion YouTube channel, we have three faces here today, and this is going to be a test of having group interviews on the Brilliance Plus Passion podcast. Our listeners know that we have short interviews and the purpose of these is really just to introduce you to people who are making the world a better place by their contributions to it and by being part of it. And what we're going to do is we are going to introduce you to two gentlemen I've been enjoying having a conversation with. Their names are Mark Petruzzi and Paul Melchiori. So essentially they have uh, they have a a book out, I believe, called Selling the Cloud. They're going to tell us about that. And we also are going to hear a little bit about the work that they're doing in areas such as enterprise software sales and some of the other things that they're doing. I'm really excited to speak with these gentlemen. So without further ado, let's introduce them. Mark Petruzzi, Paul Melchiori, welcome aboard. It is so great to have you here today. Thank you, Adam. Awesome. Happy to be here. Yeah, so the first part is of our of our conversation is going to be about spotlighting what you guys are doing. And then we're going to, the second part is going to be the one where you can show your friends and they'll finally uh, understand what it is you do for a living. Uh, one of the jokes that one of my clients tells uh, that you know really has more than a grain of truthfulness to it is that when you become a published author, your mom will finally be able to tell her friends what you do for a living. That is true. Although yeah. it, it, it's still not easy with Paul and uh, and and me from that perspective. So we'll we'll do our best to describe it as we go along. All right. So let's dive right in here, Paul. Mark, um, how does the work that you do make the world a better place for uh, your clients, your community, and the world at large? Yeah, I want to. I'm going to grab that one first, Paul, and uh, but we'll we'll be jumping back and forth for sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I think the first thing is we know we're not cardiothoracic surgeons or COVID, COVID researchers or anyone who is able to impact the world in those ways. Um, we would love to be able to do those kind of things for humanity, but, we, um, but what we do is we help businesses become a lot more efficient and companies and, in, and individuals through the, the use of of SaaS software, cloud software. So, yeah. and then we try to make the world better by, by <laughs> doing well, doing well for our families, and then doing well for the charitable organizations that we support, which both Paul and I do a great deal with. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't want to set the expectation, and I think Mark did a good job. You know, my son is a dentist in Palm Beach. I think he's definitely you know, in putting a lot more to making the world a better place, at least here in South Florida. But, uh, you know, what we did when we, you know, embraced upon this uh, effort with selling the cloud is to really help to educate this next generation of sales professionals. And we really do have a passion 
and believe that the selling profession, maybe not as important as being a doctor, uh, but very, very important. There's many, many people in the business and, you know, they've had a bad reputation over the years for not being really good at what they do. And, you know, that has a negative impact on the world. And I really do believe that if we can train this next generation of salespeople to sell in this new technology environment, what we call the cloud, cloud software, enterprise software to large companies and small, we really feel we can at least, you know, work those, you know, wheels of, of business and, and make people more successful than hopefully they're giving back. So that's at least my way of viewing it. Uh, and, and I think we're making an impact. Exactly. So uh, what are a few of the FAQs you get, the frequently asked questions from folks who are checking you out and figuring out uh, how they're going to invest in you and work with you? Well, from that perspective, we get a lot of, of, you know, why is cloud software better or more impactful than legacy software? What we, you know, Paul and I were involved in in the earlier days of all this and evolved to, towards. And um, the, the biggest thing there, and, and this is something I think Paul and I have very strong opinions on, um, the SaaS model, software as a service, has changed the entire relationship between vendors and clients in the software space. And, you know, in the early days, the early days of Oracle and SAP, there were, the, the whole idea was to sell a vision as a sales rep, sell a vision, sell the software and run away from the account and, and disappear because it became really hard work to get the system implemented and really get the value out of the system. And it was just easier for sales reps to not find themselves in the middle of that. Um, and we have to thank, you know, individuals like Mark Benioff, who really started the, the approach here for changing the whole game. So we went from this, these gunslingers from the sales perspective to what Paul alluded to before. And that is we can really now train individuals to be good, you know, I, I hate to use the term trusted advisor because it's kind of overused and, but, you know, to be a trusted advisor, to be someone that is there from day one to the end of the relationship and the end of the relationship can be three years, five years, 10 years, infinity. Uh, it really, it, and it should be infinity with good software and good relationships, because at that point you pay, you know, per seat, per month per seat, per quarter. Um, and, and in those cases, if you're not delivering a year down the road, you will not be, you will not have that client a year and a day down the road for sure. Yeah, and a lot of exactly. the questions I think that we get, Adam, um, in addition, are around how do I retrain or how do I train my sales organization, my go-to-market organization, my delivery organization, people who are customer facing, to, to operate in this new kind of environment. And, and we just see how fast technology is changing. I mean, all the recent, uh, you know, national news around AI and chat GPT. And, you know, I kind of wish I was in college now because I wouldn't have to, you know, do all that struggling to get these papers written because I would just go online and have it done. So I think we're starting to see in our everyday life, the impact of technology. And I think if we look back, say 15, 20 years, it moved at a certain pace. Now it's just moving at a, an amazing pace and we just don't see it slowing down. And therefore, when you start to you know, incorporate in your go to market organization, how do you sell technology into companies today is very different. And we're trying to enable that and train uh, this next generation. And I think they're the kind of questions that we have, like, what is the profile of this next generation sales professional and, and, and really getting that individual trained and, and, and efficient and productive in, in organizations today. Exactly. What are a few questions you wish people would ask? I guess one of the things I'll lead with is, you know, really, how do you, how do you impact your clients? Um, that is, I mean, that's really what makes what we do really rewarding and really makes the, the cost of these, these SaaS software subscriptions um, valuable to our clients. So it's, it's a lot more. And I guess the other side of it, the second part is, you know, how did this impact the, the structure of these software companies and the structure of this, these software companies 
because it's built on long term client relationships, because it's built on this subscription model, you know, Wall Street has valued these companies much higher because Wall Street likes um, the, the, there to be less risk. They like to be able to look and see relationships and know what, how much future revenue is going to be driven off of those, those past relationships. And, um, and I think that has made these organizations more stable and able to do more for their clients as well. Yeah, and I think, Mark, what people should ask, excuse me, is that, you know, what are we doing as an organization, if you will, uh, to better have relationships with our customers? What do we need to be doing internally to make sure our customers are put first and, and we're operating in this, in this environment? Because I don't think people do ask the questions. They just assume, and as most salespeople unfortunately do, uh, they just assume that it's status quo or this is how we're going to operate or we'll trial and error, as opposed to just really asking, what are people doing? What are the best practices? What are the best in class companies doing and how are they doing it? And I think if, if people ask those questions of their organization or of their advisors, uh, we'd probably be a little bit further ahead than we are now. Exactly. Well, you, yeah. You've actually done that throughout your career and having worked with you for, for many, many years, more than we like to admit. Um, we, you know, I've seen that. What you've done is you've built sales teams you know, the tie back to the concepts we, we have in the book, sales teams that are, you know, sales individuals that are, you know, that have strong empathy, they have strong authenticity, you know, they are who they are, they have high ethics, they have, you know, the, the things that make these long standing relationships. And when we were first doing a lot of this 10 years ago, we weren't really, we were just doing it. We weren't really talking about it. We were just raising the grade of the individuals. But that just makes, you know, it makes the client experience that, that much better. And these, and, you know, you, you kind of showed in the data as well with these CSAT scores of organizations that you've led and I've led, you know, just going to, to super high heights. Yeah. All right. So, um, I really appreciate your background that you've shared. I think that's I think that's awesome, and um, I love what you're I love what you're doing with all of this. And what I really want to do now is have a little bit of fun with you guys. This is part of what we do here. It's my you know, the Brilliant Plus Passion Project was conceived by me almost two years ago because there are thousands of people that I want to connect with. But I'm not going to be going into people's DMs, uh, you know, with that me, 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 me. And can we hop on a Zoom real quick to compare us energies? I'm not going to do that. But what I do love is having great conversations with great people who are doing great things in the world. And I also like to get to know folks a bit on the human level and have an opportunity to introduce you to my community and vice versa. So typically these are one-on-one -on -one conversations, but we're going to make this a little bit of a round robin in the time we have left. And this will be a great test of how our format stands up to group conversations. We've never done it this way. So you guys are pioneers here, just so you know that. So this is where we shift gears and this is where our listeners get to know you better. So each of you tell me briefly, and that's how we'll do it in each, in the, for each of these next five questions is, what would people who know you be surprised to learn about you? Paul, I'll let you lead, lead us off of that. Uh, <laughs> I think they'd be surprised that, to, to know that um, I'm a lot more laid back than my first impression. Yeah. Awesome. And I'm going to answer with one that is for both Paul and me, um, that we were both new. We both delivered newspapers as kids. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. and that's where we learned how to manage our accounts receivable in our organization, because we would have to, the old days of this, we would have to go collect from, uh, from all our customers. So I think that's uh, maybe why we do a little bit better from an account receivable standpoint with our clients. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So um, what do you guys hope people say about you when you're not around to hear it? Hmm. I'll take a crack at that. I, I mean, look, I always like people to be up front and tell me stuff to, to my face, but I'm sure that, you know, uh, over my career, folks have kind of just said, well, I just, I can't keep up with that intensity. He's, he's too hard on me. And I think my children say that as well. I think they say that okay. to my face. 
But I do feel yeah. that, you know, you, you do have to kind of always be striving to be better and always wanting to do more because if you settle, you settle and, and you know, then you get mediocrity and, and that's just not the way I grew up. And I try to instill that in whether it's my children, my friends, my family, my coworkers, you know, everyone I uh, come in contact with. Absolutely. Awesome. So for me, I guess there's a, there's a few words that jump to mind. Um, the first drives back to my work with Charlie Green. I was involved with Trust Advisor. I used that term before and Trust Based Selling, which are two amazing sales books that I'd recommend. Um, Charlie was uh, has spent the last 20 years of his career, career being one of the most renowned experts on trust. So I've always strive to be, you know, I'd love to hear the word that people consider me trustworthy, to uh -huh. um, consider me honorable, um, creative, you know, smart. I mean, those are the things I, I work for. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what we try to do every day when we're out there doing what we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, next question is, if you could go back and time and change one thing you've done, one thing you've experienced, one thing that's happened, what would it be and why? I'll let you go first, Mark. <laughs> Good. Okay. I got a whole list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I do too. But, you know, I guess it kind of ties back, Adam, to one of your earlier questions, and, the, and that is, you know, how do you make a world, a world a better place? Um, if I had to do it all again, I love my career. I love what I do. But I also wish I would have designed my plan around helping others more than I do get to help others at this point. So, you know, I mean, I considered med school. I considered other things when I was younger, um, you know, like Paul's son, that, you know, hey, you know, being a dentist is something that you, you really get to help people every single day and feel it. That would be mm -hmm. mine. What about you, Paul? Well, you know, I wish I could have done those things, but I, I looked at my son when he was studying. I couldn't even pronounce the words. So there was no <laughs> way I was going to be able to achieve that medical degree or to do that. But one thing I think, and I've, you know, kind of traveled all over the world. I've lived in a few places, uh, primarily Philadelphia, here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in California for two tours of duty. Uh, but I really wish I would have had an opportunity to, to live and work in Europe uh, or Asia. I mean, that's to me, being a global person, if I look back, that's one of the things I look at my career and say, as global as I was, and I you know, wrote, wrote through passports and how to get extra pages. So I've seen all these places, but I think it, it does educate you when you live in different places, uh, especially outside the US and gives you a much broader perspective. So I, I did miss out on that and I think, you know, all of our children now do the study abroad programs of which I call spend daddy's money abroad programs. <laughs> Obviously, Mark, I don't think you and I were able to do those in our college days. So we did, we did miss out, I think, at least on that. Exactly. Exactly. So if what famous person alive or dead would you like to meet and what question would you have for them if you had the opportunity? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I, I'll take a crack. I mean, my favorite entertainer of all time I kind of grew up with was Frank Sinatra because my mother loved Frank. And in uh -huh. fact, if you remember the old Italian homes, you'd have, you know, the TV and then all the family pictures. So there's all these little pictures of the family and there's a giant picture of Sinatra. You know, he kind of was honored. And, you know, I'd love to just ask them what they did in those early years when they were partying in Vegas, the Rat Pack. It just looked like the most fun time that you could ever have. So, yeah, if he was back, I'd just ask him to tell me some of those stories from back in the Vegas days. <laughs> That's a great one, Paul. I am. I keep going back. I'm bounced, bouncing around, and there's so many, of course. But um, I'm kind of coming back to Mother Teresa. And, and here's a thought. This is not a religious spin at all. Um, I just have found that the reading I've done about her, that she just had more strength, physical and emotional strength than any other person that I've ever read or seen. And I, I would just like to ask her, like, how did she do that? 
because, you know, the times in our career and times we are looking to do things, times in our personal lives that you just feel like you're, you know, you just, where, where do you get the next amount of strength? Um, but we've not been challenged in ways that Mother Teresa have. So I would love to find out more how she did it. All right. All right. So what keep what motivates and inspires you to keep going when you're having a tough time or facing a challenge? Yeah, I, I, it's funny. Um, you know, if it was easy, Adam, anybody can do it, right? And so yeah. I always look at if it is too easy or if it's too cheap or if it's free, it's probably too good to be true. So I've always kind of charted a course that let me take that road that's a little bumpier, a little more challenging, because hopefully at the end of that road, is the rainbow of uh, success. And I just I just feel that you have to have what I'll call a mindset, which is actually, I think, chapter mm -hmm. one in the book. You know, and if you go through life with that mindset, you know, glass half full versus half empty, I mean, you can tell people who are, you know, that pessimistic, you know, the world's ending tomorrow. And then, you know, the type, which I think I feel I am, if the world is ending tomorrow, I'm gonna, what am I doing in the next 24 hours to enjoy that? Yeah, that's 24 hours. So to me, that's what, you know, that mindset is what keeps me going. And uh, it just makes, you know, life more enjoyable if you have a positive mindset. Right. Yeah. And I think for me, it's um, kind of goes back to the points about about strength. You know, it's not like I look at things that I want to win for the sake of winning. Um, matter of fact, that's in some, something we teach our, our clients, like this whole concept of the world we live in today, where it's like you want to win and then you want someone else to lose. Um, don't agree with that in any way, especially in sales. There's so many ways for it to be win-win, win-win-win-win, like across constituents and everything, and everything else. But I don't like to. I, I like to to challenge myself and have the strength to to go to the next level, like just to be like. When I look at things and I say, wow, I don't really know how to do this. I don't know how to fix this. And then 40 days later, I fixed it. I feel really, really good about that. Right, right. All right. So we're about a minute from being done here. And I know you have a book out and I'm going to show people where they can find more information about that. I'll do that on your behalf. But in general, what is one thing you would urge folks to do as soon as they finish streaming this episode? I would ask them to go get the book. Uh, well, I, 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 I said, I, I know. And I said, other than that. <laughs> you set that one up, Adam. Come on. <laughs> I, know I, I know it is. Like I said, the pins, you rolled the strike. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why Paul has always been just a little better sales rep than me. Right? I've always tried to. I knew it. I know how to do it. But he, he you know, he's, he's just built for it. And it's awesome. And that's why he's had such an amazing career. I would say the one thing I would do, if you're in sales, no matter how aggressive of a model you're in, like you're selling cars, you know, take a look at our book, take a look at our, our just what we've talked about today and try to make it more win-win and look at how much benefit and give it a chance because it really works over time. Even if you're completely selfish, it's still the right approach because it works over time. That's the first thing. But if you're not in sales, if you're you know, running a company, I would just take a second and, and don't close your mind off to sales. Don't be like, you know, I'm a CFO and I don't really know sales, you know, and, and I really wish we didn't even have to have sales reps. You know, there are a lot of senior executives that would probably take that opportunity in a minute and mm -hmm. just look and say, what about an amazing sales team? What about a sales team that is, uh, what a sales process that is well done and built on relationships and built on long-term, um, you know, clients? Um, what would that do to your business? What would that do to your profitability? So I'd ask them to take a second and think about that if they, if they could. Absolutely. So here is where folks, here's where folks can go. I'm going to send you right Now, if you are watching this, you can guys uh, check our show notes here. It's a page on LinkedIn. So if you go to www.linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash selling hyphen the hyphen cloud, LinkedIn 
Selling the Cloud. This is where you can discover more about the book. Selling the Cloud is a playbook for success in cloud software and enterprise sales. Uh, there's a new version of this book that's out, and I encourage everybody to check this out, whether or not you're in enterprise sales, whether or not you're involved with cloud software, because I found that sometimes we find the answers in the places we didn't think to look, and we sometimes discover answers to questions we weren't even thinking to ask because we're looking in places where others who work in our same industries or on our same wavelength aren't looking. So regardless of where you find yourself professionally, do check out this book. And as you can see from our conversation with Mark and Paul, these are people who've been around. They've seen a lot of stuff and they have some interesting views on the world that I think could benefit you in some way. So again, go to LinkedIn, look up Selling the Cloud and get your copy of that book. And with that, Mark and Paul, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been an honor and believe me in education. Thank you for tuning into the Brilliance Plus Passion podcast, where we celebrate entrepreneurs, business creators, and brilliant minds who are making a difference for their community, market, and audience. Remember to visit our website at www.brilliancepluspassion.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Brilliance Plus Passion Podcast.